him an arrogance he'll never forget. Right? And the idea is it's like a medicine. You know, you're just giving them a little taste. You know, how do you, do you like it? You know, you... Because a lot of people are very unaware of, of, of that state, and it's it's a it's a very unfortunate uh, uh, ailment of the heart, and it can be cured. All these diseases, according to the Muslims, are curable. The fountainhead, and then he says, and know that the source of all these affirm infirmities. Now he's gonna instead of going into the thirty three, he's gonna tell you what is the root cause. So if you can work on the root, you don't have to worry about the branches. You can uproot it all. You get the weed by the roots. The weed dies. The fountainhead of all misdeeds here. The, no, all, the, the source of all these affirmities, love of leadership and procrastination. The idea is love of leadership is me. I want to be in charge. I want to be the one ahead. I want to be the one. And this is more subtle than wanting to be the president or wanting to be, you know, it's, it's, it's about wanting a position in the eyes of others. It's about wanting to have a position. Jah. What they call hubbal jah. The Prophet said, love of wealth and love of position amongst people is more dangerous to the religion of an individual than two hungry wolves in the midst of sheep. And procrastination is related to, according to the Islamic tradition, the ultimate procrastination, which is the next world, with death. Putting off the idea of death. I'm not going to think about it. Let's not talk about it. The, there is a very important spiritual practice in the Islamic tradition and in other traditions uh, of contemplating death, reflecting about death, taking some time and thinking about going into non-existence. Right? And, and the idea is that it, 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 it's, a, it's a waking up, it's a pattern break. Because uh, life, we, you know, we get this idea that we're going on forever. Right? And even as the body begins to wane, we still, you know, it's just hard to keep that in focus, that we do die. And the idea is that if you can become aware of your death, then experiences with people become more important. That, that the, the moments that we live, the moments that we share with our family are more important. The idea that, that death is something that can take us at any time, that can seize us at any time. It's not a morbid type of, of you know, you start wearing black and, no. The idea is literally of, of becoming really aware of one's mortality in a way that enables one to, to live in the world and be free. And really this is the idea that through acceptance of death is the ultimate freedom. As long as you're afraid of death, everything will cause fear. Fear of provision, fear of uh, insecurity, all these things. That if you can accept one's death, then you can accept anything. So the idea of really becoming aware. And then what, when you begin to think about death, there's a tradition that says, work for this world as if you would live forever, but work for the next world as if you would die tomorrow. So the idea is that you begin to prepare for that. That this is a type of... It, it is, it is a, a... Rumi has a wonderful poem where he says that on the day of resurrection, um, God says, you know, tell me what you did. And, and, and he says that the man just falls down to his knees, nothing. And he looks over to the prophets and the prophets say, don't look at us. You left the plow in the middle of the field and now is the day of harvest. In other words, the idea that this world is a world for literally plowing, for preparing for the next world and that you reap the, the fruits of the next world. So that, that is part of it. And then he says, the fountainhead of all misdeeds is love of this world. The first truth, the world is suffering. The second truth, suffering is a result of attachment. The more we love the world, the greater our suffering. It's not for the more I have, the happier I'm going to be. This is not... Uh, what, what, what it's about. It is about relinquishing one's attachment so one becomes free and then one can be in the world in a way that is, is beauty making. Right? One can truly contribute to the, to the uh, human condition in the process of living in the world. The Prophet Muhammad said, smiling in the face of another person is charity. Right? Just to give a person a smile is charity. Right? The, and, and that idea of becoming aware that that is something that you will be rewarded for. He weighs his suggestive thoughts in the scale of sacred law. This is the idea of learning to control thoughts, which is a very high position in Islam. 
the idea that we can have pure thoughts and that our impure thoughts can be mastered and that we can get beyond this uh, thrust of, um, of negativity, that we can actually change the way we think and that we can become positive. There's a beautiful tradition that says, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that God says, I am in the good opinion of my servant. If he thinks good of me, he finds good. And if he thinks bad of me, he finds bad. Which means literally that we are creating our realities. That we are create that the paradigms that reside in our understanding are confirmed by our experience. And as we change those paradigms, then the experience of the world changes qualitatively. He adorns himself with the stations of certainty. So this is called mujahada which is jihad, struggling against the lower impulses of the self, that it is a conscious struggle that one has to do. So we do backbite, but we have to struggle against it. Ah, I'm doing it again. Entering into a state of remembrance, entering into a state of mindfulness, that we become mindful of our actions, right action, right thought. We begin to enter into a state where, yes, I, know, I can do it, I can change, I can do this. And each time one stops it, one becomes stronger in this struggle until it's finally conquered. And then he says, and these stations are, are fear, which is a fear, not like a fear of a tyrant, but it is a fear of being displeasing. There's a fear of being displeasing, like the fear that one has of upsetting one's parents. I don't want to upset my father. I don't want to upset my mother. That's the fear that it's talking about. Hope, that there's a hope. Gratitude, patience in perseverance, in struggle, patience, repentance, turning back, recognizing I will fall short. I was telling some, somebody asked me uh, the other day um, about how somebody was doing and I said, you know, they hit the bottom of the mountain but they've started back up again. You know, like I was saying, it was a good thing. And they said, sounds like the myth of Sisyphus, which is pessimistic, right? A lot of pessimistic people in the world. And I said to him, you know, I was once told a story in Mauritania when I was studying and I was finding something difficult. A man told me a story about one of the students there who had studied one book nine times and he couldn't get it. And this book takes about at least a year to study. He couldn't get it. Foundational book in Islamic law. And it's a very difficult book. And he decided to give it up. He was just, forget it. I can't do this. He said he went to this uh, place and he was sitting under a tree and there was an ant hill. And he watched an ant taking a crumb up the hill. And every time, right before it got to the top, the crumb would drop and roll back to the bottom of the hill. And this ant did it nine times and on the tenth time it made it over. <laughs> and so, he said, the man said, I'm not going to have the aspiration of an ant be greater than mine. <laughs> so he decided to do it one last time and he, and he had his opening. So the idea is that no, it's not Sisyphus. That yes, the rock does fall down and we do start up, but there is a possibility of getting to the top, of achieving uh, what, we, what we want, our spiritual aspirations. And then uh, abandoning wants. Most of what we have in our lives, we don't need their wants. Learning how to conquer want. I mean, this is something we as a people particularly have to do because our wants are having such a massive impact on the rest of the world's needs. But the idea is to recognize that this hierarchy is part of the world, but then to recognize the responsibilities that go along with all of that. And then he says, his actions are done, trust in God, contentment, really feeling content with what you have. That these are achievable. In other words, we have to struggle to get them, but they are things that can be achieved by the human being. And the final one is love, which is the highest station, is to love God with, with all one's heart. He's content with whatever the divine has apportioned for him. Through that he becomes a knower of his Lord, truly free, and otherness has left his heart. Now, in the Islamic tradition, there is an idea of two types of freedom. Freedom from and freedom to. So if you're free from want then you're free to live. As long as you have all of these wants, right? You will never be satiated. When you become free of those wants, then you're free to really be alive. So this is very uh, strong in, in, in the tradition of becoming free. And the interesting thing, the word for a freed slave in Arabic is also the word for a master. And the idea there, mola, what's called a mola, is that if you become a master of your lower self, you are truly free. 
right? If, if, the, if, if you're a slave of yourself, you can never be free. So overcoming one's desires. Through that he becomes a knower of his Lord. For this he is loved by God. So all of this work one enters into a divine love and uh, is chosen for the divine presence which is the maqam of ihsan, the station of ihsan. That that is the result of all this struggle. That you begin to experience the divine presence.